This talk was presented at Google I.O. Extended Grand Rapids in 2023. So we're talking about forces that are shaping AI and technology and the world in front of us. And uh, there's actually a lot of sometimes surprising things that come up from that. So I'm, I'm eager to get into some of that with you. But first, I'll introduce myself real quick. Um, I'm Jeremy Wilkin. I live in Austin, Texas. And I'm actually an academically trained futurist, which is not maybe what you think of when you hear the term futurist. This is a, a, an actual academic discipline. Um, it's not about making predictions, whereas you think of a lot of futurists are out there saying, in 10 years, we'll have our jetpacks. Um, that's, that's a different kind of thinking, and I'm not a part of that. What I really focus on is looking at and making sense of changes that are happening, on, happening around us in the world so that we can better anticipate what the future might be like, as well as to give us information about how to move forward in the present so we can make better decisions and we can ask better questions. So I'm on a personal mission, especially in the technology industry space that I'm part of, is to help bring this thinking and capability to more people. Um, we're going to take a look at why people get into this, this space in just a second. I'm going to ask you a couple questions. But I'm really interested in how can we make the future better for all. And I've done a lot of interviews as well from folks in different types of uh, technology. And often the motivating factor is because they want to make the world a better place in some way, shape, or form. And so I wanted to give you a chance. You can scan this code or go to this bit.ly link. There's two questions. So it takes very little time. But I want to take a quick poll. This will give me a sense of where you as a group sit uh, in relation to the future. You'll, present, you'll be presented with a Google form with uh, two questions and you put on a um, 10 point scale where you feel you would be. Um, normally I like to do this as like get up and move around the room, but uh, <laughs> this room's not set up for that very easily. It'll take too long. Yes, get a chance to fill it out. And I have the results should be coming. Here we go. I'll zoom in. So as people are coming in, we're seeing a mixture, not, not necessarily we're seeing a lot down here, which is the um, powerless quadrant. I'll talk about that in a moment. We've got a couple up here in the very top, powerful. Not many here in realistic or passive, or they're kind of close to the middle. So it seems like we've got a lot here in the powerful and the powerless. So let me get back to what that means. Our view of the future influences how we engage with it. And that's why I asked these questions. We saw a lot in the powerful and powerless quadrants of that two by two matrix. Um, these are not you know, exclusive terms and this is not the only way to look at it, but it gives us some indication. So for people who are in the powerful category, it's not that you are powerful, like overlording other people. It means you have a lot of agency and belief that the future can be better. And there's a power to that. The passive is you think there's going to be a lot of good things, but you're going to be kind of sitting back and watching. The powerless is you don't have a great outlook in the future. You're worried about a lot of things. And we specifically said 10, 10 years on this one. And you don't know if there's much you could, you're going to be able to do about it. And there may be varying degrees of agency there, but you tend to think you're less able than, than not. And finally, realistic, not always, I don't always love the titles that this was given, but um, you don't necessarily think the future is getting better, but you do have some ability to make change. We didn't see much in that quadrant. So typically, I see a lot of folks in the powerful quadrant who work in tech. That tends to be the strongest one because people think we can do this. And that's often the mantra of businesses is we're going to change the world. We're going to do we're going to do disruption, right? We're going to whatever that means to everybody. We're going to make the world better in some way, shape, or form. The premise, though, of foresight and futures thinking is 
what if we could better anticipate the impacts of change? Everything kind of is predicated on this question, because if we can do that, then we can get to that future better. We can increase our agency. We can increase the positivity of where we're going. And also, I didn't ask this when you think about the future. Are you thinking about your future? Are you thinking about the future of the world? Are you thinking, you know, what's the scope of that? That also can affect how you view, view things. So in the next about 40 minutes now, here's the themes you're going to see. Not necessarily, this is not the agenda one, two, three, four, but these are the things you're going to get uh, intermixed. First is some futures or foresight or really what is futures thinking? I'm going to be giving you some nuggets of that. We're going to talk a lot about trends. I'm going to show uh, a series of those and talking through them. And these are things that are really happening now. Um, from that, we'll see what are some of those impacts that happen to either you, others, the world? What are the impacts that come through those trends? Siri, I'm not talking to you. There we go. And finally, what does that leave us as far as choices? What are we going to do about all of these things? Can we do anything about them? This may be the first, first question. How many of you have watched or read The Expanse novels or show? All right, only a few. Okay, I have a, a lot of people to advocate to. This is possibly the best science fiction that isn't like hardcore science fiction. It's really human. Um, Part of what I love about that show is that the technology is not the center of the show at all. It's about the people. And of course there's technology because they're flying in spaceships between planets and things. That's not a spoiler. It's like the first thing you see in the show or the book. So I'm not giving anything away, but it's an extremely human story and uh, nine books. So it's an extensive series. This quote comes out of the second season, episode six, and uh, it's the wonderful and terrible thing about technology is that it changes everything. And this is so true. And you can think to any technology that's been out there from cars to computers to wheels, um, they change everything. I think cars are a really good example from the last century. We still develop our cities and our world around us, especially in the United States, based on the mechanics of that technology. Cars themselves, yes, they've changed, they've gotten better and so forth. But the underlying mechanical concept of moving around like we do, mobility, has remained fairly, fairly consistent. So when we make choices and technologies, they can have long-term impacts. So doing it right and anticipating that future is really important. Now, futures thinking concept number one is that the future is plural. There's not one future and we're predestined to get there. If you believe that, then we have agency. We can do something about it. If it's a tree and we're at the root, there's any number of possible leaps and nose that we might go down and we don't know which way it will go. We can consider though, this is called the futures cone. If all of the possibilities lay in front of us as a big giant cone, this is trying to explain that there's lots of different ways of viewing those possible paths, okay? There's some that are on the very fringe. I love the preposterous options, very unlikely. But, you know, dinosaurs maybe will come back. Okay, um, Jurassic Park and all that. Um, the possible is, yeah, these are all potential things. They can occur. We have plausible, the things that seem most likely or the projected, what we assume will likely be the future. There's preferable, what we want the future to be like. So this is an illustration of, we can approach the future as a set of very many, many different things. And if we think about it differently from, hey, we're going in this direction and that's the only way, then we can do something different and make an impact. So we want to actually be talking largely about what is that preferred future that we wanna to drive to? And it's not maybe one, maybe it's a couple of options because we can't always know uh, what all things will, will hold. Another thing is that the future is uncertain. And we often think about uncertainty as something we wanna squash and get rid of. Okay, every planning process I've ever been a part of is about trying to reduce risk, remove uncertainty. But if it weren't uncertain, it would be known and there'd be nothing to do. It would just be like a movie. It's already set, then you just have to watch it. So the uncertainty, if we change our 
concept of uncertainty from something we want to squash to something that we can use. It's the creative force that empowers the future. We can have a different relationship to that. We can actually embrace it. Um, I've heard it called sometimes as a technology in and of itself. It's an interesting way of looking at it. And because of that, we can explore it. We can imagine it. I mean, kids are so good at this. We lose that ability as adults to some degree. And I realize that's because I think they take recess away um, as you get older. But we can start to explore it. I'm going to skim over at the very end just like some of the concepts in like a, a strategic foresight project and how you actually use um, explorations. But really today, we're not going to get into most of that. Um, but the idea is that we can explore the future. And that's really important. Before we get into the final parts of the trends, the stuff you're probably really here to hear about, this is another really good quote, and it's, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. This premise is underlining everything that I'm about to share, because when I talk about trends, it means I have something to point to. It's not just something I made up. There's actual events, research, books, whatnot, backing it up. And so the fact is, we don't know if that will become the definitive de facto future, but we can see glimpses of things. I like to call them weak signals on the fringe of what may come up. And sometimes those things become the dominant story or dominant future. So it gives us the opportunity, particularly in the like 10, 20 year horizon, we can see a lot of things. You get like a thousand years out, it's a little harder. Um, but at this point, I'm going to share with you different things that fit across different categories. An important part is that I don't just talk about the technology. So I talk about social dynamics, technology, economics, environment, political climate, and the values and value changes. So I use this, these six categories as a way to check, am I looking at the bigger picture? Am I missing politics when I'm thinking about the future? And uh, so I've labeled each of this, these, um, these items from my research based on the categories as well. So you can see that I've got a diverse mix. So we're gonna jump into the trends and I'm gonna share a little bit about them and their impact to technology. So first, climate change. Obvious, big story, everyone talks about it. I'm not gonna talk about the, the hot conversational parts of it. It's, it's a complex thing. I actually wanna zone in on one particular event. And it's about the island nation of Vanuatu, I think is how you say it, uh, was hit by two category four cyclones within 48 hours in March. And it also has been affected by rising sea levels and is considered to have the highest uh, disaster risk in the world. So this nation was able to then advocate to the UN to, uh, how did it say, to call for the International Court of Justice, which is the highest level international court available, to consider the legal obligations that nations may have towards climate change. This is, this is a first. It's never been a global, uh, something that you could take to the global courts would be your impact to climate change. And if, and if you fail to address climate change and you're one of the top polluters or emissions, um, the charge is that there should be some ramifications. Now, this, this is still a recommendation, so we'll see this play out. But what happens with this is what else could happen for smaller nations or nations who are disadvantaged by technology to use something similar? What might they be able to do with a uh, UN or, or other types of international bodies to influence the shape of technology. Countries will not be equally impacted by AI or other technologies. They are not equally investing in it. So how will that play out? Um, a lot of these nations also don't have the same value systems. So what is acceptable in one place may not be in another. And the, the global nature of some of these things, a lot of our technologies, could come into a lot of pushback. So, so the question here, the, the concern is, how else could disenfranchised whether nations or, or, or peoples uh, push back on these technology changes? And how might that affect you or your, your work? You know, there's the court of law and then there's the court of public opinion. So just because 
it's not illegal doesn't mean people are going to like you. And this applies to technologies. It applies to companies. It applies to, you know, movie stars, all of these things. Um, I have actually quite a few things and I just kind of lumped them all into this because I wanted to just simplify the idea. There was um, a couple weeks ago, both Sundar and Musk gave exclusive interviews on primetime TV. And while it wasn't exclusively about AI, it was one of the main themes. So we're seeing very public, very broadcast uh, information about AI coming to, um, to the general public. There's also been several letters that have been published, open letters from leaders around the industry and the field and academia um, on with various reasons. Uh, one in particular was about pausing AI development for six months. Uh, there's also summits at the White House for AI and an endless stream of AI related news and articles all over you know, CNN and everybody. Many of them might also have been written by AI. So the popular opinion is a uh, all of yarn. Like we do not know where it's all going, but you can look at some polls and see that there's a lot of uncertainty. And we go back to that concept of uncertainty. Here it's, it's almost fear um, because a lot of people don't understand it. They don't know how it will affect them or how it will apply to them. And it seems like it's changing really quickly and it's potentially going to come for their jobs or that's the, the, the message they're hearing. So depending on what they pick up and how they approach the topic, popular opinion could be a really big force that crashes down on various things, whether it's uh, politicians who need to then you know, go regulate things um, or it's on the companies themselves who are developing things. It's something to be really cognizant about. There's a lot of noise as well, and people are picking it up. And again, depending on their uh, platforms and how they receive information, it could be filtered and funneled in various different ways. So we have to think about what is our responsibility as an industry to that public public opinion and getting information and things out there for them. Who benefits from the technology? Generally, technologies are developed with a specific purpose in mind. Uh, a company will develop it because they, they think there's a market for it. But there's also the questions of who may be disadvantaged by it or harmed even. And it was in the keynote a little bit. They talked about this. Um, um, we go back to like steam engine, the combustion engine, modernize the world, but at the same time, carbon emissions and the mobility culture that we've developed came through those things. Who always benefited? Not necessarily the people um, that we think should have. There's a store in Australia. It's a grocery store called Woolworths. They're, um, they're going through a situation where they were implementing uh, self-checkout systems where there was an AI-based uh, scanning tool that would help to make sure that people were actually correctly scanning and entering items. So, you know, were there four or five apples? Did they put in the right code? Did they miss something in the cart? These kinds of things. And it was intended to help like prompt them on the checkout screen or whatnot. They, this is obviously benefits them, reduces the number of people they have to hire. It should make it more uh, accessible for people to check out on their own. It should help avoid product loss to accidental or intentional theft. And so they put this through in a couple, I think over a hundred of their stores, but they also gave options to opt out. So they still have regular systems where you can go through and somebody can check it out for you. Um, and uh, they also took the care to make sure that there was no way that people should be able to watch the recordings live. It was only um, available for like quality assurances and then that faces and payment terminals and things like that were all blurred out. So they take uh, a number of steps to try to protect privacy and care for the people who go through it. So I think this is a good question of who benefits because other stores have tried this and failed. Kmart rolled this same similar type of thing out and was forced to roll it back because they didn't provide opt out alternatives. And that was a big issue and concern. So when we talk about beneficiaries, are we building these things and considering all of the people involved? Often it comes down to privacy in these conversations. That's a, a hot, box, hot button topic, but it's not just that. It's also, what are the preferences? Does everybody really want to go through a particular uh, automated process? 
but that human element is, is gone. But what about the, uh, the labor force? And we know there's a lot of shortages and things like that being uh, addressed as well, but the different benefits, uh, people who benefit from this type of technology is something that has to be considered and weighed. And so anything that you're developing also needs to follow through with who's benefiting, who's, who's being disadvantaged or potentially harmed, and are there ways to mitigate or reduce that focus? In this case, with Woolworths, they were able to give that opt-out option so that folks could use the regular checkout lane. So they didn't make it a full all or nothing choice. Sometimes that's a simple enough solution. In other ways, you've got to do the harder work of figuring out other paths. Lawsuits, everybody's favorite, right? Lawyers will always find a way to keep themselves going um, because they are very, you know, that's part of their job. So there's a lot of existing laws that are not particularly well suited to the future that's rapidly approaching. So we've seen the, the section 230 or whatever, you know, with the social media laws and who's responsible for the content. Those are all older laws that are being legisl uh, legislated through lawsuits, basically. And those go through the court system. And so we're getting a lot of lawyers and judges making a lot of decisions or calls about what do things mean. And a lot of that is based on intentions that don't necessarily cross over to today's world. Some of these things are 20, 30 years old and the technology has obviously dramatically changed. So given the fact that we're in a world where laws often lack, and I'll talk more about this in another section, but um, we have to think about the, the legal ramifications of these lawsuits who's filing them and actually pay attention to them. So one example uh, is stable diffusion. Are you familiar with them? They, they make uh, some of the open source models. They were being sued around data rights and usage of data and training. And this was gonna be more of just, not just uh, for those individuals, but it was gonna set like precedent if that goes through as to how data can and should be used by these models, potentially at least. Um, it's, there's always a possibility that these lawsuits can kind of turn into sort of a law um, or at least a precedent that is then enforced or they can settle and these things disappear and we defer the question for some other time. So paying attention to these things is, is actually a really important part, especially for folks in emerging fields. Um, a lot of times this is really a stopgap. It's another pushback me mechanism to figure out, okay, somebody doesn't like something, so they try to find the best angle to get the, the law or some other law to sound close enough to push back on it, but it maybe isn't really aligned well. And so it, there's a lot of values also and politics associated with some of these things. So it's really hard to know where these things will go, but at the same time, if you're not paying attention to the lawsuits in the space, you're missing out on the big picture and how that will affect the industry. There's some interesting feedback loops. Um, you know, we're trying to electrify everything, it seems. There's a big push to everybody should be driving an electric car, everybody should have electric appliances and all of these things. Um, there's actually some cases where the EVs are being considered uh, as banned. Some of them are political stunts. Some of these are actually pragmatic. So one of them is that Switzerland is considering um, not a full ban, but regulation around when electric vehicles can be used so they don't um, have issues with the power grid. So if there are, if there are power outages or what's the, um, certain times of day and things like that, they want to limit the usage of, of charging for those. So that's a pragmatic approach. It's a system-wide concern, but it is pushing back on, hey, let's electrify everything. And then there was a bill in Wyoming, and I think also there was one in Alabama, or it was another state, I can't remember, introduced that was to um, phase out EVs by 2030 instead of the other way around, which is normally what you would think. And it was a political stunt. It's not really going to happen, I don't think, but uh, it shows the power of vested interests and the feedback loops of, hey, these are the systems that are in place today. We can't just change everything and expect the world to just shift over to the new to the new thing. There's going to be pushback. There's going to be ways that those things fall over, like the electrical grid could fall over if they don't carefully consider how to roll it all out or vested interests push back against it. So 
what are those feedback loops in your areas? If you're working on HR systems or if you're working on any type, whatever the niche area is, what are those existing systems? And you know, again, who are the beneficiaries of some of those things? How do those play out? And if you start to change them, what kinds of impacts might that lead to? I don't think uh, we can electrify everything because there's certain cases where electrifying things like vehicles, uh, there's some some examples where that maybe just is worse than not. There's human in the loop is a common term used when you're training systems that you're trying to give humans a chance to check, hey, how well is the output? So human in the loop is often uh, utilized in, in a lot of the training of AI, but can AI actually train itself? Can it be entirely isolated from the human creation process. Like can humans just see the result? And that changes the paradigm. And this is a paper that was put out from, um, it was researcher at Uber created a project or project called uh, Paired Open-Ended Trailblazer or POET, which was basically uh, an obstacle course generation tool, which was an AI tool that was then used to train other models. So AI system training another AI system. And what it would do is learn the world of physics by being placed in a physics-based world. And that AI system would cover that. Um, one of the most intensive parts of developing is that feedback loop, is that human in the loop part, checking, running the system, checking the outputs. If you can take that away and just let this run without that, it can actually speed things up. So we hand over more responsibilities to computers because they're actually better at some of these things. Or if we can put the right constructs together, these things can kind of build up and, and make things go more quickly. This is a research paper, so it's not yet a, a production thing, but it shows that there could be a lot of possibilities in this space. This is really interesting. And this is a technical change. I haven't talked much about technical changes, but if this becomes a standard practice, then what means what that means for a lot of us in this technology space is we have to be really good at validating outputs, testing the systems at the end, because we maybe aren't going to be inserted into the middle of the pipeline like we think we are today. If that changes, then we need better oversight. We need better standards and tests and ideas of what is good outputs or good results. Um, sometimes we do that as we go rather than at the end. And so things like there's no test right now to determine if a vehicle is considered uh, fully self-driving or not. There's no standardized test for that. So Tesla says that they have full self-drive mode. That's the name of the system, but it doesn't drive 100% of the time, every all the time. Um, and there's other examples of where that may be, really, well, they're actually, they've been sued about the name, about the, the nomenclature of that, what it means. But if the humans aren't in the loop and if the AI systems can, can improve really, really quickly on their own, then we need to figure out how to evaluate them at the, at the end and put a lot more effort into that because we won't be along the way. Regulation, back to the laws and politics. Um, regulation generally lags. We see it as a repercussion to some events. So seatbelts weren't in cars until 1950s or 60s, which in retrospect seems like, why weren't they there to begin with? Um, cars didn't go as fast. Um, there weren't as many of them. The roads weren't that good, so they couldn't go that fast anyways. Uh, whatever the reasons, they weren't developed with the same levels of safety and standards we have today. But because of that, lots of things happened to force their hand. A lot of regulation comes through some kind of a catastrophic event, essentially. However, that's actually not the standard. So India right now recently reviewed their stance on regulating AI. And they have a ministry for IT. And their result was they thought they actually had a good framework that they didn't need to do more at introduce any you know, legislation or additional regulation. So in this case, they actually want to encourage growth. They don't want to add any kind of slow down and put the brakes on any development in their case, because India hasn't had the same growth as say the United States, as far as um, AI startups and development. So they want to provide an area of innovation. This is interesting because I think that we generally look at regulations always coming in like 
increasing and causing more you know, hassle and so forth. But in this case, it's actually, we're going to withhold them. We're going to let things develop. And they didn't say, we'll never do anything. They just said, right now, we don't think we need to do anything. Uh, so pay attention to where things are. If you're a global in a global space, or if you're in a regional market, if you're just in the United States, you can pay attention to how regulation may be going in this space. But if you're going globally, that's going to be a lot harder. You have to pay attention to a lot of different things and it's going to change a lot from, from region to region. So um, the general trend though, is that regulation follows and is we're waiting to see what we need to regulate as a, you know, governmental body or something like that, or as an industry, potentially, sometimes industries self-regulate. Um, I think Google has mentioned some areas of this uh, today in the keynote. So this is an important thing to pay attention to. If you're going to be involved in that space, you want to be aligned with those things. <laughs> there was uh, the idea that maybe you don't need a stockbroker or a financial advisor anymore because chat GPT in a research paper was um, given all the news headlines coming through on a daily basis, and it would it would rate them positive, negative, or neutral. And they took that and correlated that with, they did some kind of scoring to it, and then used that to make predictions for the next day's price. And voila, they would have made decent money because it was better than uh, random, at least, in actually predicting the next day's returns. Now, it got worse further in the future. That news was really... Um, information gets processed really quickly in stock markets. But the idea is what is not specifically so much the, the stock market part, but the information piece is really interesting. How is information flowing? Who's getting it? How are they utilizing it? Stocks have always been, not always, but for, for many years now, um, a lot of automated trading. I think more stocks are bought and sold automatically by computers with nobody overseeing them than humans are doing. So that's already the, the case. But if they incorporate deeper language understanding of the world around them into that, that's another level up. And so that's a really interesting idea. But then we think about the other places where information is being um, processed. And this is part of why ChatGPT has been so big and, and the other models and BARD and such. But the, the public availability of ChatGPT made information feel extremely accessible. I could summarize huge chunks of information into three sentences. Now, I wasn't always happy with the results if I knew what was in it, but the, il the illustration of information flow is just going to continue to improve. And so what we do with our systems and when the rate of information flows and its understanding increases or is automatically processed by these systems, um, what's that going to do for you? What kind of opportunities do you have? Um, what kinds of Things do you need to guard against, right? If you're if you're a company now and you're submitting news like your uh, quarterly earnings and uh, press releases and things like that, um, right now it's going to become even more imperative that you time those things, you avoid leaks, you figure out the right way to process that information for maximum benefit, because a leak could instantly cause your stock to crash uh, significantly, and that does happen, already happens, but it can happen at so much faster speed now. And as more people incorporate this everywhere and into everything, uh, dissemination of information is just going to be like basic operating system problem <laughs> that we all incorporate into our daily lives. And the last one is water scarcity, not something um, necessarily directly associated with uh, AI a lot of times, but actually, um, you know, you've heard about like Lake Mead is historic lows. I live in Austin, which has a lake that's currently 40, lower 40s percentage full. Um, this is not unusual, but it is still concerning. Um, it's, it's a global problem though. Water shortages and quality has been on the decline. Water tables are lowering. And so uh, a paper was processing, uh, was reviewing the training of ChatGPT and estimated that it took uh, 100 and 85,000 gallons of water in data center cooling requirements to just to train uh, GPT-3. And then they went so far as to say every 20 to 50, depending on the size of the prompt, uh, prompts into chat GPT, about every 
So let's just average it out. Say about every time, every 30th one is like a water bottle amount of water consumed and cooling the data center. So if you use it 30 times a day, you're basically chat GBT is drinking uh, an equivalent of one bottle of water. And how does that, how is that going to play out when water scarcity is more pronounced? In the U.S., our efficiency in our data centers is higher than maybe in some other locations. So this can be a bigger problem in certain areas. Um, but this is not just about you know, climate change. This is about if this is a resource that we need to use for multiple things, what will end up being the way that we use it? What is the opportunity for us to reduce our impact our, our, uh, you know, on energy, on water consumption? Um, how can we develop things to avoid these types of conflicts? So at the end, this is really, how do we help ask better questions of the future? Uh, this is the strategic foresight framework. I just give it to you. It's way too small to read from back there, but know that it's out there. Um, the basic idea though, is that you want to understand the landscape and then you want to try to influence it. So the scanning that I, the research that I do is basically what you see on the left. Uh, the various stages of knowing what you're researching, actually doing the research, and then imagining what the future may be like if those things are projected forward. On the right side, influencing is what are the impacts of those changes? What kinds of decisions and options do we have? And then finally, how do we evaluate and keep track of those things so we can adjust our course over time? Because it's like a boat. You're not good. Boats don't actually go straight. They're always being jostled around a little bit. You've always got to continuously course correct. So when you think about the future, you can't just say, here's the future, we're going to go get it and do it. You've got to spend some time continually checking, hey, where are we now? And it's not every day, but it's something you should be doing on a consistent basis. So I think it's our responsibility as technologists to consider the future and all that we do today so that we can make that future more preferable for ourselves and for others. And if we use it, that we can actually make it better. If we don't use the future, who knows what will happen? So it's our responsibility to do some of that work as well. Here's my email, my LinkedIn. Again, if you want to reach out, I'm happy to chat more about things, but um, thanks for having me.